everybody. Today I want to talk to you specifically about what I call the 738-55 rule. And this is a major rule in the communication circle. And you see, I've been a trainer for a long, long time. Trained multinational companies as well as Christian organizations. And therefore, we come across the 738-55 rule, which is the basic fundamental rule as to how to communicate. So we are going to get into that. And before we do that, the reason I think this is so important is because every single one of us watching me and probably even watching me later via YouTube uh, are called to communicate. And we are all communicators. God has called us to communicate. And the greatest message that God has called us to communicate is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16 says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So uh, the messenger is important. The message is even more important, but you need the messenger to communicate the message. So we're going to be touching on a couple of things and I know that this is going to be a benefit to all of us listening to me because you may have the message right, but if I'm not able to adequately compensate the clarity of the message, uh, I'm going to be inadequate in, in portraying the, the depth of the message and probably that's the reason why people don't get to believe the message. So we're going to talk about the 738-55 rule. Before we go into that, let me go into a scripture from the Bible and this has been uh, misinterpreted uh, many a time but I want to show it and give it some clarity. The book of 1 Samuel chapter number 16 verse number 7 I'm going to read the last line for the Lord does not see as a man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart and so what has happened is this we have seen this verse and uh, come to the conclusion that well God is concerned about the innermost being of my heart I don't care how I look on the outside it doesn't matter how I appear. It doesn't matter how I communicate. Uh, it doesn't even matter what I, what I'm, I look like, uh, because end of the day, God is concerned about my heart. And for man, looks at the outward appearance. So, in other words, there is a truth within a truth. Man, very rightly, does not look at the heart, for he cannot see the heart, but he looks at the outward appearance and see. It's only when he appeals or he's appealed with the outer appearance then can he can he get to know a person better. To imagine any relationship that you have been into. First there was this outward attraction, uh, a magnetism and that caused you to like somebody whether it's a colleague at work or even your spouse for that matter. And then we went into knowing the heart and then we began to understand the person but I can tell you this. The outward appearance is more like a gateway and the communication begins right there. And so I know I'm going ahead of myself, but I want you to realize that giving the importance for the outside man in this world that we live in is a key to be able to penetrate the message and communicate the message of Jesus Christ. Because he says in Mark 16 verses 15 onwards and even the book of Matthew's gospel, chapter number 28, he wants us to preach this message and in other words he says sharpen your communication skills and when you sharpen the communication skills you are able to transmit this message very clearly so basically the 738 55 rule is a communications rule or rather it's a communications methodology by which we understand how important communication is all right let's just quickly go into the three V's. The three V's stand for visual, verbal, and vocal. Okay, what is visual? Visual is self-explanatory, what you see. And therefore, when a certain communication takes place, whether it's a meeting or face-to-face, -face, these three V's kick in. First is visual, what you see. The next thing is verbal. And the third, of course, is vocal. Verbal is the use of of words and so for communication if I'm right now I'm communicating to you in English I must have the words the vocabulary it's like the building blocks and that's very important for communication as well and if I don't know the right words I, I I'm not able to communicate so that's verbal the last of course is the vocal vocal means the way I use words in other words the intonation 
the stops and the starts and the the pronunciation the the pauses all this constitute to what i call the vocal so remember whenever you're communicating to somebody all these three v's kick in the the message of the cross the preaching of the cross is so very important and we need to be effective communicators of this amazing message we're going to be talking about the message and the messenger as well but let's let's continue with this we need to take a good look at how much visual takes uh, in terms of 100% uh, how much vocal takes in 100% how much verbal takes in 100% so uh, go ahead and and, and make a, a small note somewhere if you say uh, visual is more important than vocal uh, make a percentage and you, you can probably uh, divide it maybe it is 40 40 and 20 or uh, 80 10 and 10 or uh, 70 and uh, 15 and 15 whatever you may it may be I don't know but I mean I just take a piece of paper and or even mentally uh, divide the percentage but what I'm going to say today is so important because this is the world view as to how communications is perceived in other words you automatically use these faculties to ascertain the percentages to ascertain good communication so are you ready for this uh, the 3v percentage breakdown that's why I call it now if you're smart enough I call it the 7 38 and 55 rule Make a lot of this. 7% of meaning is communicated through the spoken word. 7%. 38% of communication is through the tone of voice. And the balance, the huge winner, 55%, is basically through body language. Vocal, verbal, and visual. So the highest is visual 55 percent is through body language and visual though this is the world view i want to also concentrate about how jesus used these communication skills so effectively and he i believe he's the greatest communicator in the whole wide world and we're going to see why but remember this this is the world view and we ought to take that give it give it a second look uh, because whenever we need to preach the message ensure that we are appealing to them on the outside and then it's easy for them to look at you and then your his mind or her mind begins to do a calculation and once they you appeal to them it's easy for you to pass the message on and that's very important that's why i i, I believe in appropriate dressing uh, in appropriate communication good quality videos so that it is appealing to the person watching I mean, have you ever watched a, a, a video with bad audio or a bad video? Uh, you see, people will not even watch it for two minutes because the audio sound is bad and the video is bad. So communication is hindered. And that's why we call it barriers to effective communication. So uh, if, I'm, if I'm saying something and you're not able to hear me, that is a barrier to communication. So a barrier could be even the way we look, uh, you know, not kept well and not dressed well and we're not appealing to the crowd so well that's another subject altogether i do not want to get into that but my main main importance of this message today is to realize that you're a carrier of an amazing message and because you're a carrier of this amazing message we must take a good look at how jesus communicated this amazing message to the masses as a matter of fact jesus was so effective in his communication people were there for three days can you believe that three days they didn't even have a meal to eat and on the third day jesus says well the people are hungry let's give them something to eat and that is the miracle which happened right there so jesus was able to captivate his his audience with the amazing message of the kingdom of god moving on i want to make sure that we understand the importance of the message and the messenger the book of Jonah is an interesting book uh, before we step into how Jesus communicated. Let me just quickly take a good look at how important the message is. Jonah, the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 and reading 1 and verse 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. First of all, it is very, very important to note that God in his awesome wisdom has included man in the plan of communicating this message that's why he told his disciples in mark 16 15 onwards he says 
go into the world, carry this message to the world. He included man in the awesome plan of communicating this message. And I always wonder, I'm sure angels would have done a much better job, but why did he plan to give this amazing responsibility to man? And the only answer I can think of is this, that we are his sons, we are his daughters, we are his children. And therefore, how important it is for a father to hand over the most important, valuable, the message to his own children. That's the whole reason why you and I are called to be communicators of this particular gospel. And that's the reason we need to sharpen all our skills, including our appearance, our three V's, visual, vocal, and verbal. All the three are important. But remember, the communication is mostly when we sharpen these three areas that we can communicate this message. Coming back to the book of Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for that wickedness has come up before me. And to me, the message is identical. It is the same. We, are need, we need to carry the gospel of goodness, the grace of God to the nations of this world and tell them there's a God in heaven who loves you. Turn and come to Jesus. And that's the greatest message. It says in verse number three, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Now, the message has come. But you know what Jonah does? He takes away on the opposite direction. And the Bible says he tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. And let me say this. There are two components here. First is the message itself, the greatest message. The message Jonah had to take to the people of Nineveh to tell them to repent. That is the message. Number two, the messenger. You see, the message is always greater than the messenger. The messenger may be inadequate, but the message is all powerful. And I'm, I take pride in the fact that I'm the messenger of this great gospel. I'm not, not be perfect. I may not be 100% right in the things that I do, but I want to thank God the message is greater than the messenger. Remember that. So as we go along, check this out because now I want to let you know in the wisdom of God, there's no such thing as a failure. The message will go somehow or the other, the message will go. Now remember, uh, Jonah took off on the opposite direction. You see, Jonah thought he was wise to run away from the presence of God. But let me tell you this, even the unwise Jonah was included in the plan of God that the message went forth without hindrances. What am I saying? Book of Jonah chapter 1 verse number 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. You see, God's message can penetrate any situation. To Jonah, he was running away from God. But for God, that was an opportunity for the people in that ship to hear about God, Yahweh. God's message is powerful, my brother. He was running from God, but God has his way to proclaim that message even on that ship. And the Bible says, then they said to him, what shall we do? And he said, you throw me, pick me up and throw me into the sea and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. And so in verse number 15, they picked him up, threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. I like verse 16 because you see the message will go forward. The man ran away from God, but still I want to let you know the message of God is unhindered. Today, I want to let you know, I know we may be facing situations, facing persecution at different levels, but I want to let you know this. If we understand the power of the message, if we understand the importance of the messenger, if you understand how we can communicate this wonderful message, nothing will come against us because this message is unhindered. It was, it could not be hindered even by Jonah, even by default, the message went to the people on that ship. Watch verse number 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. There was an evangelism class right on that ship. And that's an amazing thing. And our friend Jonah thought he was running from God. But God says, wherever you go, this message will be preached. I'm going to use you to preach this amazing message and so on and so forth. We are not going it forward, but end of the story, uh, the Ninevites, they repent, they cry to the God and the whole city 
is converted and changed. So at the end of the day, it's a good news. The message of the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to run into the communication methods of Jesus. And I think as communicators, as people who pr preach the gospel, we need to take a good look at, at this. And this today, you know, let me tell you this much. The power lies in the message. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. For the message of the cross or the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. In other words, there's nothing wrong in preaching with gusto. There's nothing wrong in speaking loud. There's nothing wrong in running from stage to one corner to the other. Nothing wrong. It's perfect. It's the message of the cross. It is the power of God. Jesus used three methods of teaching his disciples. First one is a practical learning method or the OJT on job training. I do training programs and sometimes uh, we call it the OJT. So we, we let them work and we sit next to them to observe how they do and correct them as they are on the job. So Jesus, first of all, used the concept of practical learning. For example, John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 22. The Bible says, And after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Yes, though he didn't baptize himself, he was there, and he was giving them what I call the on-the-job training. Again, in the book of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, reading from verse 14, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a father who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, uh, my, my son is not well. He's demon-possessed. I took him to your disciples, but your disciples could not do anything about it. Uh, help me. And so Jesus rebuked that spirit and he was instantaneously set free. In the book of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse number 19, the disciples come to Jesus uh, privately because they wondered, how did this happen? We did the same thing. Nothing worked. How does it work for Jesus? So he came to him and they said, why could not we cast it out? Jesus said, it's because of your unbelief and so the number one most important thing in communication is what i call practical learning and there are certain meetings that we have to see power of god move uh, we pray for people to be healed and when the testimonies come out that they are healed people turn to christ and therefore uh, signs and wonders are a practical way by which we can draw people into the kingdom check out my website we have a lot of videos where people have testified to that healing. Uh, we do crusades. When these crusades take place, people are healed. Eyes open up. Uh, people who are in with pain, pain leaves them. Uh, a lot of other things do happen to the glory of God. So that is the one amazing way to communicate the power of the gospel. The next way to communicate the power of the gospel is what I call a private learning. So again, Jesus, remember, he had 12 disciples. And out of this, he had three close-knit uh, disciples, again, from that 12. So therefore, Jesus also involved in what I call private learning. In private learning, for example, in the book of Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, and Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, uh, you will see that Jesus taught them to pray. As a matter of fact, the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, John the Baptist has taught his disciples to pray. Would you please teach us how to pray? And therefore, the Lord teaches them the Lord's prayer you see it was a private learning moving on we go to the book of mark's gospel chapter 9 reading at verse number 36 he was wanting to teach them a lesson uh, an, an, a, a practical lesson so he took a little child and set them in the midst of them and when he had taken him in his arms he said to them whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me and so on and so forth even in the Mount of Transfiguration, he took three of his close-knit disciples up the Mount of Transfiguration and he allowed them to learn an amazing truth about the law and the prophets and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And when the voice from heaven says, listen to Jesus, I know there's Moses, I know there's Elijah, but listen to Jesus. So that was private learning, not for everybody, private learning. Moving on, Jesus also was involved with what I call communicating in public, or I call it the public learning. Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. Uh, we, we are, we're not going into detail here, but again, Jesus began to teach the multitudes about how the second coming would be and how the, 
the wrath of God is going to be poured upon this world. And he gave them a lot of insights, uh, which is public learning and, and the Beatitudes and many things Jesus spoke and he said, it's all to do with public learning. Even the food uh, with a small boy's Mac meal was multiplied to 5,000 men. All these miracles was basically public learning. So three important things, practical learning, private learning and public learning. You see, visual is a very important aspect of communication. It's just not uh, the words, it's visual. So when people saw that, they saw a big message. Uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he condescends to uh, wash his disciples' feet. That's an amazing object lesson right there. Not only that, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, the Bible says uh, he called a child uh, and, and, and placed a child amongst them. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he drew an object lesson by placing a young child in front of them. And that's an amazing way to communicate the gospel uh, truth. Well, moving on in Mark's gospel, chapter number 12, reading from verse 41 onwards, the Bible talks about a woman who dropped in two mites and watched Jesus was sit seated right at the treasury. He was not there in the pulpit. Uh, no, he was there watching how many people drop how much of money. And then out of that, he began to draw an object lesson. He said, you know what? This woman gave it all. She was the best giver. But she had just given two mites. But Jesus said she gave all that she had. And I think that's so very important. So number one, remember, object lessons and visual representations uh, send the point home very very clearly and therefore it is it's a good thing for us to communicate not only with words but with actions and i remember saint francis of assisi saying this he says preach the gospel and if necessary use words and what he was meaning is i i, I understand i was working for malaysian airlines for many many years uh, as a head of the airport operations uh, in the city i live in uh, before i quit and became in, came into ministry to serve the lord on a full-time basis but i remember in that situation I can't open the Bible and preach. I'm not called to do that. The company doesn't pay you for preaching in their premises. It's not the right thing to do. But I thank God for object lessons. Not only are you using objects, you become the object of the communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I think that's a very important takeaway from the object lesson of Jesus. You are called to be that light which is set upon the hill. Jesus made this very clear as he spoke it in the gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Verse 16, he says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, an object lesson, not just bringing in an object, but you become the object. Uh, and, in, and that's a very powerful communicative tool. So, are we living that witness? Acts 1 8 says, You shall be my witnesses. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before men. So, we are called to communicate the gospel not only with our words but with our life. Jesus was the greatest example of an object lesson. He says, I love you so very much. He went up the cross and he died for us. John 3, 16, For God loved, so loved the world that he gave. The book of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it, it pleased the Lord to bruise his son. It was just not, I love you, but there was a demonstration. It was an object lesson, a visual representation and I think this is so very important for us to, to speak the gospel today the problem is this many of us are accused of us preaching a great message but life and lips are not in sync with one another and I pray though I realize the message is profoundly important the messenger you and me we need to be in tangent with that amazing message well okay moving on the Bible talks about another way he communicated is by means of a dialogue. And this is so very important. Jesus used simple dialogue. Throughout the Gospels, you would see Jesus dialoguing with people. Good example in John's Gospel, chapter number two, the wedding of Cana. There was a conversation between him, his mother, him and the servants there. And uh, you know, he turned water into wine, a wonderful miracle right there. Moving on to John's Gospel, chapter 3, you see the, the dialogue, the discussion with Nicodemus. The Bible says Nicodemus came in the night and he had a conversation with Jesus and Jesus gave him the greatest revelation he had ever heard, that he should be 
born again not in the natural but in the spirit again it was all a matter of dialogue number three going back to john's gospel chapter four uh, the samaritan woman at the well jesus started a conversation uh, using water as his common ground and then you see he built on him being the one who is the thirst quencher uh, he said if you come to me you will never thirst again the dialogue finally ended in this woman becoming the evangelist of those days went to the village called them and says i know who i have been speaking to he could be the son of god a great man and so uh, the whole town at least uh, heard the message of jesus what an amazing story so that was a dialogue so today my friend uh, it is vitally important that we communicate with people have a dialogue talk on common subjects talk about what is uh, bothering people and build on that so that you will be able to pass on the greatest message uh, to them the message of the gospel of jesus christ moving on again the another way jesus uh, began to communicate the message is what i call through comparisons again if you see matthew's gospel chapter 5 we're not going into detail but he says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are those who meek or who are meek for they shall inherit the earth so you know what jesus was doing he was giving a comparison if you are like this today if you seek the kingdom you'll be transformed into something better and the climax is matthew's gospel uh, chapter 6 verse 33 he said seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness all these other things shall be added unto you the bible again says in the book of matthew's gospel chapter 13 talking about the the comparisons of the parable of the sower he says the sower went out to sow but he was not talking about the sowing part he was talking about how the seed uh, would fall into the heart of man and begin to produce fruit so lot of comparisons he says the kingdom of god is like so and so he began to compare the kingdom of god through natural things and and he compared how the kingdom of god would operate he said it's like a, a woman taking a little bit of leaven and putting it in the dough and overnight there is a transformation well the list is endless but you know what i mean jesus used comparisons to communicate the message moving on jesus used what i call the a hyperbole A hyperbole is a, an overstatement to prove a certain point. Example at hand, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, uh, verse 24. And the Bible says, And again I say to you, watch this hyperbole. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This is a hyperbole. I mean, he took it to such an extreme that you need to stop to think what he was saying well he is not talking about practically a, a rich man entering through the eye of a needle no 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 he had a message behind that we're not going into the message and neither was jesus indicating that a rich man will not reach heaven no that was not his message but we're not going into details anyways again matthew's gospel chapter 5 reading verse 29 he says if your right eye causes you to sin pluck it out and cast it from you for it is more profitable that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell and so the lord was saying this if your eye sins take it out what of the next eye sins pull it out and he went on to talk about the hand if your right hand causes you to sin cut off your right hand and then what happens to the next one if you sin again with your hand cut it off you see the point was not about cutting your hands or pulling your eyes He was talking about the reason why a person sins is the condition of the heart. And so Jesus used hyperboles uh, to to bring forth a message. And today you and I uh, we must be able to contrast the system of this world to the system of God. And sometimes I preach this way. I said listen to me. The system everything in this world is failing, you know. The banking system, the education system, the financial markets everything is failing but you know what i can can, can i tell you about one system that never fails they say which one is this then i tell them the kingdom of god it never fails it never falls you see we can cause a hyperbole uh, to bring forth this message well um, take a good look at this message one more time because all that i'm saying i may be a little quick in in moving on but that's the reason why this is recorded uh, you can go to our website sandeepdaniel.org go to our youtube channel sandeep daniel Uh, check this out sandeep daniel ministries check it out and if i'm too fast that's the reason we record them 
that you can visit our site again and listen to it that you'll be able to understand the different methodologies of communication of our master Jesus Christ remember you are that messenger and unless we carry that message and adequately present the message can somebody be benefited the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ it is you whose God is depending on you you are his mouth uh, you are his hands you are his feet and that's that's so important my brother my sister well let's move on another way Jesus used to communicate the message is by, by the usage of pun so what is a pun a pun uh, is a form of a word play that exploits multiple meanings of a term or of similar sounding words for an intended humorous or rhetorical effect or to prove a point so let me give you a few examples of how a, a pun sounds she had a photographic memory but never developed it that's a pun well uh, the two pianists had a good marriage they always went in a car a chicken farmer's favorite car is a coupe another pun is this how do construction workers have a party the the pun is they raise the roof and so these are all puns so Jesus used so many puns in the way he spoke therefore of course uh, we will not be able to fully understand it because he was using the the language of that day but uh, in in Matthew's gospel chapter 23 and 24 he says blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel so the word gnat and camel are both gamia or galma he was playing on those words I am not a Greek student so I'm not able to adequately explain it but one thing I know Jesus used puns to get a message across and the people of that day understood exactly what Jesus was speaking and the next way Jesus began to communicate is by asking questions he would always invoke a question and then he would begin to explain and that's a fantastic way to communicate the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ asking people what do you think of this present crisis what do you think of the scenario of this COVID-19? What do you is expected of this? What is your take about what happens? And so when people come up with an answer, you can always go back to the scripture and assure them that the kingdom that we are built on is the kingdom which will never fall and never fail. And what Jesus did on the cross is an answer to every problem that you are facing. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 26. For what profit is a, it is to a man that he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Another question. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? In the Matthew's Gospel 22, reading verse 20. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So it was all in, in terms of questions and then he answered the question. John's Gospel, chapter 21, reading from verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these? And then again he asked him in verse number 16, uh, do you love me? And again in verse number 17, do you love me? Question. Arising out of the question, he was able to bring the right answer. And, and, and of course, Peter said, Lord, I love you. Uh, that was how he invoked an answer by asking a question. Again, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, reading from verses 13. Jesus asked a question to his disciples. He says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Ask them a question. So, Jesus was good at asking questions. You can use this methodology to ask a question and then give them the answer. The last but not the least is Jesus used what I call repetitions. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 31, you'll find that. In, he says, and Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and must be rejected by the elders and you will see that again in the mark's gospel chapter 9 verse 31 again in mark's gospel chapter 10 verse 33 at least three times in the book of mark itself jesus repeatedly told them that i will die and I, they will put me in a tomb but on the third day he said i will rise again that's good news that the christ that we worship cannot be held in a tomb he, will ro he rose again from the dead. He's got the keys to hell and the Hades. He's, he's seated on the throne. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He has all authority, all power, rule and reign. And this is the good message 
The reason why we are doing this is because I know that we are serious students of the word and we are learning how to communicate and I pray that all that I've said would come some way or the other handy that we will remember the methodology of Jesus. Remember this, uh, the, the power is in the message but the messenger is equally important because he carries the greatest message of all time and I pray through this particular teaching you will be able to speak this message with clarity, with conviction because that's what is expected out of you. Remember the rule, I know man looks at the outside so do all that it takes for people to accept you that the message of Christ will go unhindered. Thank you for this time. May the Lord richly bless you.